we kind of had a short Sunday school, so we didn't finish a week. So we're going to pick back up where we left off last week. Uh, we're on lesson 11, starting on page 85. We're just going to read through the scripture again pretty quick and then go back to the question where we stopped. So on, uh, uh, we'll pray, and then we'll, then we'll just read over 2 Peter 1, uh, 2, 1 through 22 again. Uh, let's open up in prayer, and then we'll jump back in where we left off last week. Jesus, we pray over our time this morning. We ask that you uh, bless this church. You bless our services this morning. Help us to uh, glorify you in the proclamation of your word here, both in our uh, Bible study hour and also in our service this morning. We pray that you just prepare our hearts and minds for worship for you, and that you uh, just allow us to grow in our knowledge of you and our likeness of you. Uh, please help us to just... Uh, do all that we do in your glory. Amen. One um, thing, does anybody want me to take all those croissants and warm them up yeah. with jelly, maybe? We, yeah. We, we, uh, we'll uh, do we, that. we do have croissants left over. Okay. Uh, and yeah, we'll mention again in, in the service, but thank you all for all your help the past couple weeks. We've done a lot in just the last two weeks between the Palm Sunday, Easter, the drive through prayer, the fifth Sunday sing. A lot's happened in a short amount of time. It took a lot of people doing a lot of work to get it all done. So thank you all for that. Um, I'm going to quickly just reread the scripture we read last week, Second Peter 2, 1 through 22, and then we're going to jump back into the questions where we left off last week. So on page 86, Second Peter 2, 1 through 22. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there were false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who, brought, who, who bought them, and bringing themselves swift destruction. And many will follow the destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world of the ungodly. Verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot, who was opposed, uh, oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment and especially those who walk according to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise authority they are presumptuous self-willed they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a ruling accusation against them before the Lord but these like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed speak evil of things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to uh, gross in the daytime they are spots and blemishes grossing in their own deception while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin enticing unstable souls. They have a heart uh, trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and have gone astray, following the ways of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Page 88, verse 16. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. 
for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure uh, through lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. All right, so that was a long section compared to what we've been reading the past, throughout the whole book. But um, remember where we've been so far in Second Peter. The first, he's broken up into four different weeks. First Peter was quite a bit longer. The second Peter, he broke up into four parts. The first part was know your salvation. The second part was know the scriptures. This third part is know your adversary. So he reminds them, you know, of their salvation that they've been promised. He reminds them before you, the, this is the heart of the book. The main point of Second Peter is be on guard against false teachers. But before that, he reminded them of their salvation. He reminded them of their uh, of the truth in the word. And then he's telling them, know your adversaries. Okay, so last week we kind of talked about the first couple questions. Um, what are these people's motives? And... Um, and what's really going on uh, underneath with these false teachers. So why do they do what they do and what's really at play? We went through this a bit last week. Why do false teachers teach falsely? So why not just live reprobate lives apart from the church? Why come within the church and be a wolf in sheep's clothing and preach heresy? There's that original sin that people want to be like God. Mm -hmm. They want to control uh, what other people do and so power over them. And uh, the church people are typically receptive to teaching and specifically to teaching about God and uh, those who aren't grounded in the word can be easily swayed. Absolutely. Good. Yeah, and, and, and this text here isn't, specific, isn't talking about people who just preach things incorrectly by accident or, or, or they themselves are misguided. These are people who are, are specifically trying to mislead the church. They are trying to, put, to pull people away from the well, church. And sometimes it's for material gain, like the guys that wanted the power to lay hands or whatever. Yeah, tried to Absolutely. <coughs> Um, I believe I was thinking of Simon. I think in the yeah. next, yeah. everyone's saying Simon almost, but um, but yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely, very good. Okay, I don't know that the Judaizers would necessarily be put in that situation or in that category because I think many of them passed on a What they were teaching. Um, yeah. So 
Judaizers were definitely wrong. Well, you have to roll your die. Um, what is it? But, uh, but I agree with you. They, they, they weren't specifically trying to lie to people. They weren't trying to pull them away. They were wrong. They were teaching, you know, a work salvation. You know, you had to believe in Jesus and you had to follow these rules. And they were wrong. But, but I, I agree with you. Uh, that they, uh, they, they weren't necessarily trying to be uh, to pull people away. Okay, let's go to question number three. Some say we should live and let live. That it's arrogant and even wrong to question the sincere beliefs of others. What does this passage say in response to such a charge? That it's wrong. Uh, yeah, 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 there are people who say, you know what, you want to believe that? Go ahead. But don't push your beliefs on me. Or, uh, you know, it's arrogant to think you're right and I'm wrong. Except for when it comes to thinking that I'm right and thinking that uh, my belief that, what, what was it you said, that I'm right and you're wrong is wrong? Uh -huh. That belief is okay for me to have and to enforce on you. Yes, it is itself a double standard. You are correct. Uh, um, yeah, th there's also the thing that, that that's exactly kind of what these sh wolves in sheep's clothing are doing. They are, it's not, okay, I'm going to believe what I believe, I'm going to let them believe what they believe. They are specifically trying to uh, subvert the truth. They are trying to lead you astray. And so they aren't doing it either. Well, that goes um, back to the motive, though. I mean, the yeah. question to person who genuinely believes something that's an error, okay. I mean, they still, you know, they have, they might have the best intentions, it's just that in the situation we're talking about, the guys who are trying to lead people astray do not have good intentions. Right. Yeah, but, uh, but okay, then fine, even with people with good intentions, they have two different beliefs. You know, why is it okay for you to push your beliefs on them? when they think they are just as right as... Well, because we're commanded by Christ to do it. Absolutely. I mean, the Great Commission, that's what it's all about, is to tell others, in spite of the discomfort we might feel in telling them. Yeah. What I want to be true doesn't have any validity, you know, doesn't have any effect on if it is true or not. And, 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 so, um, and so, yes, you know, it, it is not opinions that we are sharing. It is the word, and it's not based on what I want. It is based on what it says. And so that, that is what we proclaim. That's why we have authority. You know, it's not because it's what I feel, what I like. It's what, this is the truth, and the truth is higher than I am. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, okay. Well, uh, we're going to read the going deeper section and then jump into those final questions for that. Uh, someone want to read Jude 1 through 25? Jude is only one chapter, so there's only verse references, not chapter references. Page 89. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and, a, and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all glorious to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for their condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God to lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, Afterward, they showed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper dominion were left their own foes. He has reserved an everlasting kingdom of their darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these dreamers, the vile, the flesh, reject the 
authority and seek legal dignitaries. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contention with the devil, he is disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a lying accusation, but said, The Lord disputes you. For these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally of brute beasts, and these things they corrupt themselves. <coughs> Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of kings, have run evilly in the air of Balaam, Prophet, and perished in the rebellion of Sarah. These are spots in your lessons, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the wind. Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about the end also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of the saints, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all their hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to be an example. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that they would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause division, not having the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garden of the rock, is defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with his deeply joy. To our God, our Savior, who is alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Um, um, okay, so uh, I guess I've never really compared Second Peter and Jude before, but uh, did you notice any of the similarities between the two? The, uh, they, they reference quite a few of the same same things. It's almost as if one was reading the other and commenting on it. Uh, because a lot of their examples are the same. Uh, yeah. Do you see any of them? In, in Second Peter, verse 12, it says, but these like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things which they do not understand, will utterly perish in their own corruption. Over here in Jude, verse 10, but these speak evil of whatever they do not know, whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts. Yes. Brute beast is not a, is you know it was one of those phrases that kind of sticks out at you. It did wrong for any second Peter, and then all of a sudden you see it here in Jude also. Uh, there are several others that were the same between the two. Anyone seen the other ones? You know, it's like it's like that picture where you gotta spot the similarities. Where is Moses? The uh, so s several of the examples they go back to within Old Testament are the exact same. Yeah. Sodom, and Sodom and Gomorrah. That was in both of them, absolutely. Um, they mentioned angels in both. I don't know if they mentioned Michael in both, but they mentioned angels in both. Uh, Balaam. Yeah. Balaam is in both. He is mentioned both in uh, Second Peter and here in Jude. And then he calls them sensual persons who are caused division. That's very similar to what he said, to what uh, Peter says in Second Peter, as to why they were doing what they were doing. Uh, he said they are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts. While Peter says um, they are spots and blemishes, uh, 14, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. Uh, they have hearts trained on covetous practices, or cursed children. He goes on and says many of the same things about them as Jesus. So uh, there's a lot of similarities between these two texts. And so uh, what do you learn from the Old Testament examples that are cited here in Jude? We talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. We talk about Balaam. Um, what else? They were like 
Kane. Yes. Uh, the Lord, having saved his people out of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. There's a lot of Old Testament references here in Jude. So what? Why is Jude reminding us of all these things? Why does he to tell us what happened to the last people who disobeyed the Lord? To follow your own thinking, you were so know everything, kinda. a warning yeah yeah um so often we kind of we it's easy to see you know <laughs> what happens when we have hindsight you know we look back and we read these stories but then we see evil today or those preaching a false gospel or those doing other things today and we think that they just go off scot-free and uh, we don't really realize that if God has been the same all the way through and it was just as dangerous, just as dangerous now to preach uh, lies as it was then as well. Uh, okay, it says read Matthew 23, 1 through 36. That's a pretty long section. See if we can break it down just a little bit. Matthew 23. Okay, uh, we'll, 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 uh, let's just start reading it, and we'll probably pause partway through. Uh, Matthew 23, starting in verse 1. The, Jesus said to the crowd and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, and do and observe whatever they tell you, but, do not, uh, but not the works they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move uh, them with a finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their... So this is what it's going to go on. It's the seven woes to the Pharisees. I don't want to have to read it all because we're, uh, you know, in 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone... And on and on. Uh, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you cleanse, clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but the inside are full of greed and self-indulgence, you blind Pharisees. 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanness. <coughs> It goes on and on. Um, so the question is, based on all this, we can keep reading if you'd like, but do Jesus' words strike you as too harsh, too lenient, or just right, and why? Well, obviously just right. Okay. <laughs> because he's Jesus. Yes. Anything people. he says is just right. Right. <laughs> but let's say somebody else walked up to the Pharisees and said these same words. We'd be like, eesh, man, that wasn't very Christian of you. Oh, that was yes. pretty harsh, Fairly man. Fairly God spoil the child. I've heard that. In this case, the Pharisee. Wow. Take your words. <laughs> wow, spare the rod and. Uh, Is one trend <coughs> Yeah, on, on the Pharisee. Okay. Um, so I don't think many people would see this as too lenient. Uh, um, the question is, is this too harsh, too lenient, or just right? You know, is it, you know, the porridge too hot, too cold, or, but, um. Yeah, 
I should have called down his angels to smite them on the spot, I guess, is what they would do. Right, the yeah, two just, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it depends Absolutely. if it's being said to you or not. And Ananias and Sapphira type situation is, is warranted here. You know, the thing is, is that we often do question, though, why didn't God do something about those Pharisees? You know, so we, we sit and joke about being too, you know, that it couldn't, you know, nobody would describe that as too lenient. I believe there are a lot of people, especially among the Christian people, who would say that God was too lenient with Pharisees. Uh, absolutely. And that Jesus should have done more. But when you call out the sin, a lot of times, like, like, like if someone here, you know, someone within our wall, someone even that I know, is, is a sinful problem. I will call out that sin. I won't, I won't sugarcoat it. I'll say this is wrong and here is why. But, I mean, remember what he's calling them over and over again. You hypocrite. You whitewashed tombs. You blind guide. And he's, he's right, he's not wrong, but we don't actually talk this way usually when we're calling out, is that... We call it an ad hominem attack. You're getting personal. You're not just calling out the sin, you're getting personal yeah. about it. You're calling us names. Yeah. You're not being nice. Right, yeah. You're being I, I mean, mean. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that it, so calling out the sin, people don't necessarily have a problem with. You know, people would, if someone were to just do, this wasn't in scripture. If someone were to just do this today, they think, man, that guy's not very Christian-like. You know, he's, you know, and, and, and I think what that does is it exposes what our assumption is as to what really is Christian. You know, you, you know if we were just take these words of Jesus and not say, oh, it's Jesus, it's obviously correct. <laughs> uh, if, if someone else were to have said it, he wouldn't have been any less correct but we still fear that oh you know you can't talk like that to someone well there'd be another argument too who are you saying because you're a sinner too yeah. and 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 does that then mean we're unable to call out sin Absolutely because not. we ourselves are sinners just just because people would have us error in the complacency does not mean that we're obligated to do that. In fact, we're obligated to do exactly the opposite. Absolutely. It's his role. He's given us the imagery of he's the shepherd, we're the sheep, he's the husband, we're the bride. Like It is his role to protect the church and what he allows <coughs> to happen in the church. Okay, so then Jesus saying this is correct. Uh -huh. Is it only correct if Jesus says it? Or does someone else also have that authority? Because you are correct. The well, shepherd is supposed to protect the sheep and the church, and you are correct. Well, what does Christian mean? Like, it's being a little Christ. Like, you're going to follow Christ and his ways. Yeah. Um, so, like, often, we've taken on that role, too, to protect the church. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have to be careful. There are people who, who think that, you know, uh, they should flip tables all the time because <laughs> Jesus did it, you know, Jesus Once did it, so it's going to be my, my go-to. You know, they're like, like, oh, I don't like it. Time mm -hmm. to flip some tables. <laughs> and we have to be careful. Uh, but it doesn't, but it's not outside the realm of possibilities. <laughs> it's not outside the realm of something that could be the correct response. Pastor Alex, have you ever flipped a table? Not, not literally, <laughs> except for maybe Monopoly when I was a kid. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but, um, yeah, do you, you know, do, uh, do, just like, you know, uh, Paul, he, he will call people out by name. He talks about Alexander the coppersmith. It really annoys me the only Alex I can find in Scripture is <laughs> not that great of a guy. But Alexander the coppersmith, you know, like, like he, he even said he did, he did us great harm. And basically, God will punish him. And he, yeah, it's not just like, oh, Alexander. You know, it's like there's a bunch of, he specifically says Alexander the coppersmith. So they know exactly who he's talking about. You know, you know, it's, it, there are times you have to call someone out directly. There are times within the church, you have to, the church has to know so-and-so has done great harm to the work of God. And this is, uh, it's, so it's not, should not necessarily be our go-to, but it's not anti-Christian. To make these kind of claims, you know, they are hypocrites. They are blind guides. They are trying to lead people, 
and they are leading people further from the truth. That needs to be called out at times. So if somebody is attacking your family, how are you going to respond? As a husband, you know, I'm going to respond um, with force to protect them. Well, is not our spiritual condition of greater value than our physical? Right. So if somebody is attacking us and leading uh, our family astray, is there not points in which the response needs to be what might be considered today harsh because we live in a time where niceness is kind of the go-to. You know, we don't want to... Thou shalt be nice. Thou shalt be nice. And people forget the first ten. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, I remember that in Exodus. Okay, so then this basically goes along what we've already been saying, but question number seven. If we are to be imitators of Christ, what should our response to fall what should be our response to false religion? Call it out. Call it out, yeah. Yeah, but it's not an attitude really. How you say it. What's the correct attitude? With humility and and you know, don't go in their face like you want to. You know, people react to how you act. A lot of times, I think, right? But sometimes if you act soft-spoken, they won't take you seriously. But you could start loud and still be nice and get your message across. Do you think? The truth. Yeah. So, okay, so, 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 so these specific texts are specifically in reference to those people who would try to lead people astray. They are trying to... Now, there are people who are going to sin and you've got to confront them, and we want to do the Matthew 18... The, hey, I'm coming to you as a brother. I want you to, you know, there are times for that, absolutely. Um, and then there are also times to, well, flip tables. There are times to, and it depends on the context. So the harshness of what's happening here, you know, you, you read that Matthew 23, and you're like, wow, Jesus is not holding back against these Pharisees. They are specifically trying to keep their power, they are trying to lead people to yeah. false, uh, lead people away from the truth in order for, you know, for their own selfish gain, and there is a time for a different attitude in that situation than you call someone out for their sin or other things too. So, uh, and I wonder, let's talk about human nature, I wonder if the Pharisees would have even recognized the criticism had they not been, had it not been a forceful attack, you know, it's one thing to point out a thing nicely that, you know, you might want to consider doing it a different way. Blah, blah. This is ingrained within generations of Pharisees. This is something that is their culture, their lifestyle, and I would argue that you're not going to get their attention to something that's antithetical to their lifestyle if you don't go bold. Yeah. Don't go big. Uh, you're correct, and and and, and people always call it unloving to, 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 to say these things like this. Well, what's going to happen if you don't? You know, if, if if things continue on, you say nothing. You know, what's going to happen to them and to those that they've led astray? I mean, Pardon you know, you time. you being what, what 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 they consider as mean in the moment is going to be insignificant compared to the punishment and stuff that are awaiting them. And if they don't, if they don't uh, turn from, they don't confess, they don't uh, pray for forgiveness, things will be much, much worse in the end. So you are correct. In some people, that's the only way to wake them up or to have them uh, even realize their error. What do these passages say about apostasy? That is, about rejecting truth after one has has claimed to believe it. Or if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in death and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Yeah, back in Second Peter at the very end, kind of of our text. 
for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandments delivered to them. You see, sometimes they just don't care. Right, but... They try um, both sides, and they've chosen a side and just don't care. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <coughs> but, the hardening of the heart? Is yeah, that... and, and I don't know how it's going to be worse. It seems like it's going to be bad either way. But, 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 but we do know this from Scripture. If they know the truth and they reject it, they specifically, they know it's true, but they don't care. They would so want to go their own way. They want to do what they want to do. It's going to be worse for them than it would have been otherwise. Yes? How do, you, how do we make sense of that in light of Romans 1, which says that uh, all men have the truth written on their hearts? So does that, because you said uh, specifically know it's true, but doesn't everybody know it's true to some extent? Or are we talking about like a conscious versus unconscious understanding? I guess to know it's true depends on what you say by it. Like, to go back to Romans 1, what is it that everyone knows? attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse, for though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show him gratitude. Right. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. For what the can if, be known about God is plain to them. God has shown it to them. But the if that is known in Second Peter is gospel. the gospel. Right. Yes, okay. I think I think yeah. Every single things. man, you know, knows in their heart of hearts, you know, knows deep down that you know, you know, that there is a creator, that there is a power higher than themselves, that God does exist, and these things. But Second Peter is specifically think, referring to the gospel. Absolutely, to the, the you know, you know, Jesus Christ is the perfect Son, and these kind of things. I think yes, okay. everyone is guilty. Everyone is guilty because everyone knows deep down. But those who have been told the truth, who are aware of it but still deny it, there is something different for them. That is so, worse. Pastor, what about, like you mentioned before, the Pharisees and how that was, I mean, we talked about that. It's part of their culture. It was ingrained in them. So almost to the point of being deluded or being delusional in the moment. Um, what about those people who believe in their heart of hearts that what they're saying, what they're doing is true right. versus what you're telling them, what, what you've confronted them about? I'm trying to go back to where it, um, Uh, yeah, no, that's why this is so dangerous. That's why false teachers are, you know, is warned against time and time again. Because what they're doing is not only heaping coals on their head. What they are doing is they are giving other people a false sense of, of assurance, a false sense of security. And so that's why this is so dangerous. Why it's called out time and time again in Scripture. You know, Throughout the epistles, they could talk about any kind of sin. They could talk about, you know, homosexuality and how destructive it is and the problems it can cause for you. And there are lots of sins that are mentioned in them. But there's really an emphasis on false teachers because of what the consequences are, of how bad things are, not just for them, but for all those they have led astray. And, and, and yes, those people have been, allowed themselves to be, uh, led astray, and you know they, we are all called to be led by someone. You know we all have a shepherd, and uh, and we have to be on guard as to who that may be. Um, but that's why this is such a big deal, because it's a big consequence, not just for them, but for many of us too. Uh,
Okay, uh, good. I think we're going to... Uh, yeah, uh, we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, we're going to pray and go ahead and get ready for our service. Uh, next week we will uh, go to the final one from this book. We'll go to chapter 12, or uh, week 12. So we've done know your salvation, know the scriptures, know your adversary, and lastly it'll be know your prophecy. So um, we'll finish off First and Second Peter with week 12. Right, let's pray. Jesus, we pray over uh, this study. We thank you for, again, um, just helping us get through this week by week, text by text. We thank you for just what we've learned over the past couple of months from both First and Second Peter. Help us to remember them. Help us from to remember the truths of First Peter that, though you know we 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 may be in times of just uh, persecution, that you will see us through. And your promises are still true, and help us to remember as Second Peter has uh, warned us, just to know our scriptures well, and to be on guard against those who would try to lead us astray. Uh, help us to be like Christ. Help us to love. Help us to be merciful, but also help us to call out false teaching um, and uh, just know how serious it is for those who would try to lead others astray. Uh, be with us this morning. Help us to proclaim your gospel. Help us to uh, worship you well in the service ahead. Dear I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.